This is Anna Adamek in Vancouver, August 30th, uh, 2017. Could you give me your name and where you were born? My name is Chris Fleming. I was born in Zimbabwe. It used to be called Rhodesia uh, in southern Africa. Uh, were your parents involved in science or did they encourage you to go into science? No, my father was a lawyer and my mother was a stay-at-home mother. So when did you become interested in metallurgy or minerals? I didn't really become interested in metallurgy at school. I, uh, I did sciences at school and at university and uh, in my last, uh, I did a PhD degree at university and uh, I had sponsorship from a mining organization mm -hmm. and uh, they gave me a job and uh, that, that was how I entered the mining business. You did your PhD in Cape Town. Uh, why Cape this Town university? Cape Town University in Chemistry, yeah. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose that university? Well, where, where I grew up in Zimbabwe, there was only one university. And uh, at that time, they weren't very strong in the sciences or the engineering. So, so most uh, students went to South African universities. And I liked the idea of going to Cape Town. So your first job was in South um, Africa, or in did South you? In South Africa, mm -hmm. yeah. The, what was it? Could you tell the, me? Uh, the uh, company that uh, gave me a bursary for my PhD uh, was a semi-government research organization called Mintech. So I went to work for them when I finished my PhD, and uh, I stayed with them for 16 years until I came to Canada. Why did you decide to move to Canada? I was offered a job. What was it? I was uh, I did, in, in my time at Mintec. I done a lot of uh, my research was in gold processing, and uh, I came to Canada in 1990. And in 1998, I'd been invited to uh, to Canada to speak at a uh, a course that the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy was was holding for a new process that we'd been quite involved in developing in South Africa called the carbon and pulp process. Mm -hmm. So I came over to Canada to that uh, was a MedSoc meeting in Winnipeg in 1988, and I presented this course. And uh, soon after that, I, I heard from a recruiting company who uh, approached me to see if I'd be interested in coming to Canada. So the company that was trying to recruit me was Falconbridge, mm -hmm. and they had a division, Lakefield Research, uh, and. They could see that the gold industry was exploding worldwide and they wanted to get a, a leapfrog into the gold business and they figured they could do that by bringing me over to Canada. So. Just to go back then, um, you mentioned the research that actually, I guess, made your career. Can you talk about that a bit more? Sure. Uh, it was a carbon and pulp process. Uh, I done a lot of work in gold processing in, uh, in the 1970s and then carbon and pulp process was actually developed in the United States, but it never went very far in the United States. Uh, there was one quite small plant in, uh, in Homestake in North Dakota. Um, our people at Mintec had visited that plant and saw the potential for it. And, uh, Back at Mintech in South Africa, we started doing some, some work on the process and on particularly some of the, uh, the, the mechanical practical aspects to adapt it to, to very large scale operations because the plants in South Africa were very big. So uh, we, we did this development work at Mintech. I was part of a small team that was involved in the development work and in basically introducing it to the gold mining companies in South Africa and uh, they embraced it very quickly. It, it took off between 19, 1981 and 1985. Uh, five or six big plants were built in South Africa. Uh, the gold industry has always been very uh, collaborative. So, so gold miners were coming from around the world to see what was happening in South Africa. In the late 1980s, the process spread to Australia, Canada, the United States. Pot plants were being built everywhere. and. In a remarkably short period of time, in about 10 years, the gold industry changed from the old process that was called the Merrill Pro process to carbon and pulp. Uh, almost all the new plants being built were carbon and pulp. So it was that carbon and pulp process that, that was the, the subject of the short course in Winnipeg that they asked me to come and speak at. Mm -hmm. So what was your role in developing of that process? So I'm a, I'm a 
process chemist uh, and I've learned a lot of uh, engineering on the job so I was able to uh, to go back into the fundamentals of the process they weren't well understood the plants were built and they were operated and they operated quite successfully without people really knowing much about what made it work that was my role uh, I, I did a lot of fundamental research uh, on the absorption I learned how to model the process so to make it easier to design new plants but based on, on the fundamentals of the process. So, so that was my strength and, and my contribution to that team. Mm -hmm. Who would you consider your mentor? My first boss when I joined uh, Mintec in 1974 was a guy called Mike Nichol. Uh, very, very smart guy. He's also a chemist. Uh, and uh, I worked side by side with him. We published many papers together. and. Funny, when I left university, I thought I knew everything. When I got to Mintech and met Mike Nichol, I realized I knew nothing. But uh, he mentored me, uh, taught me tremendously. Uh, so I give him most of the credit for whatever I became subsequently. Uh, so 1990s, you moved to Canada. Uh, did you find any differences between the culture, research culture in South Africa and in Canada at the time? Yeah, I, I came from Mintech, which was a research organization. It was uh, mostly funded by government, so they did a lot of research. It was applied research that needed to have some practical outcome, but it was financed by government, so they, they could take a long-range view on, on research. When I came to Canada, I joined Lakeville Research, which, despite the name, was not a research organization. They provided testing services to mining companies and and very seldom did research. Only if there was a real problem in the, in the approach that they were taking or the flow sheet that they were developing, they might get some funding to do a little bit of research to try and solve the problem. But they were not a research organization. So that was the biggest change. I also moved into uh, more of a management role, managing the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so that became more my reason for going to work every day than, than doing fundamental research. But I've maintained an interest throughout my career at Lakefield Research on the technical side. Um, and I've continued to write technical papers and do research. But um, it's, it's been a lot more difficult because in a commercial testing laboratory, that's never your highest priority. So what responsibilities did you take on at Lakefield? So, uh, so I came in 1990 to Canada. In 1992, I became the general manager of the Lakefield facility, or the Lakefield Research. That was our only facility in the village of Lakefield in Ontario. We had about 120 employees. And uh, for five years, that was my job until, well, not even five years, until 1995. So I was reporting to Falcon, which they owned us. And in 1995, I learned that through through the man I was reporting to in Falcon Bridge, uh, also a very well-known Canadian metallurgist called Larry Seeley, that uh, Falcon Bridge might be interested in selling Lakefield Research. And uh, if I could get my act together, they might be interested in selling it to the management group. So, so I worked with Larry Seeley. He was initially responsible for selling the company. Uh, to work out a deal that would be acceptable to Falcon Bridge. And once the two of us had uh, worked out that deal, um, Larry sort of declared his conflict of interest and said that he would like to actually join me at Lakefield Research. Mm, that's interesting. So uh, Falcon Bridge was quite happy with that arrangement. They, uh, it was a good deal. They, they, they didn't want us to pay so much for the company that we would go bankrupt, but it had to be a fair price. So we worked that out, Larry and I did. Uh, Larry immediately left Falcon Bridge and joined me and we became a private company. So what was your relationship then um, with uh, industry or with academia as a private company, private research company? It was the company same now. relationship. Uh, although we were owned by Falcon Bridge, we'd always worked at arm's length uh, because we provide services to the, to the mining community at large. And even we did work for other nickel mining companies who, who might have been seen to be in competition with Falcon Bridge, they were quite happy for us to work uh, for them. 
so it was a very unique relationship for a for a company that was what was owned by a mining company that allowed us to to work in that way. So changing to a private company never changed that client base in any way. We we continued to work with them. Falconbridge certainly in those initial days was a was a major client of ours, but uh, certainly not our only client. They maybe gave us ten or fifteen percent of our business. So we worked mostly for Canadian companies uh, in those early years. One of the reasons why we, we expanded and we did expand very rapidly was that uh, in the, in the mid-1990s there was the sentiment towards mining was not good in Canada. Um, there were, I think the government in BC was, was very anti-mining and even Ontario was not very favorable. So up until then a lot of our business had been coming from Canadian companies and we were, we felt vulnerable. Uh, Canadian mining companies were were moving overseas. They were they still kept their head office in Toronto or Vancouver, but they were starting to spend money overseas in exploration. And we felt that if we were to remain viable as, as a private company, we needed to follow them. So uh, in the only six or seven years that we were a private company, we grew very rapidly uh, geographically. We, we started up laboratories uh, in all the major mining companies of the world. Um, and that, that was, was Larry's responsibility mostly. I mean, we, we had a shared responsibility in, in that uh, sort of strategic growth area. My responsibility was more on the operations side. So he was the chief executive officer and he went out there and grew the company very rapidly and gave me the responsibility of running all those acquisitions and integrating them into our, and our global network. Uh, so we, we started up in quite short order laboratories in, in Santiago in Chile, Johannesburg, South Africa, Perth, Australia, uh, Belo Horizonte in Brazil, and we started a small laboratory in Lima, Peru. So just in those four or five years, it was it was crazy busy, it was exciting. Very impressive. But also quite scary. <laughs> what were some of the projects that you worked on? They were, they were quite sort of geographically focused. A lot of our work in our uh, Western Australian laboratory in Perth was related to uh, nickel laterites. That, that, that was a rapidly growing business in, in Australia. So it was mostly hydrometallurgy related to base metals. Uh, in South Africa, a lot of the work we were doing in our laboratory there was gold, gold based, quite naturally. Um, Chile was mostly copper, also copper and gold. Uh, so it, it, they, they, you know, our, our business in the Lakefield site grew very rapidly as well, despite the fact that we were setting up this this global network. And and how it sort of turned out was that our laboratories around the world became very good feeders uh, for project work coming back to Canada. So we would do the, the sort of scoping level studies, uh, the, the preliminary studies in our regional laboratories, and once it got to piloting, they tended to come back to Canada. So despite setting up this network of laboratories around the world, which might have been seen to be chasing business away from Canada, during that time we grew from about just over 100 employees to nearly 400 employees at the Lakefield site in Canada. So it was it was very good for our business in Canada. What was the recipe for success then? We had uh, we've always had a very uh, the, the Lakefield site was was the flagship. That was where all the expertise was. Uh, we've, we've it's a it's a lovely place to live, um, and. We've had a very low staff turnover there because of that. So, particularly our, our senior engineers, our experienced pilot plant operators have been with us 20, 30 years. So, I think that um, that, that, that that combination of knowledge and experience made us very powerful technically um, and able to tackle very diverse uh, projects and metallurgical challenges that were coming from around the world. Uh, we've always also being able to respond to whatever market forces have demanded based, based on the business cycle, based on different commodities. We, we work on just about every element in the periodic table at different times. So uh, we've been able to stay reasonably busy through the down cycle because even in the down cycle something is going well. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a, as a 
we're now 70 years old, uh, so we already at that time had a very long history in the service business, and in the service business you have to be able to respond to what your client wants, you've got to be able to do it quickly, um, just good project management. Mm -hmm. so. And then 2002, I believe, uh, came and moved to yes. To, yes, so, uh, SGS. So we were only a private company for, uh, for seven years, um, and then SGS came knocking. Uh, SGS is a, is a very big um, multidisciplinary global company based in Geneva. Uh, they've got 10 different business lines, very strong geographic presence around the world, something like 400 offices and laboratories. They were relatively weak in the minerals area and particularly weak in our area which was consulting, testing, uh, flow sheet development and I think that they just felt that they could really leapfrog into that business sector by making an acquisition. So, uh, yep, so they came knocking in 2002. Um, initially we weren't that keen, that interested. We were, as I said, it was, it was quite stressful growing that rapidly, but uh, it was also quite exciting. We'd also just come out of a couple of quite tough years and we, we could see the good times coming. So, um, it wasn't the best time for us to be selling because we'd, we'd had a couple of tough years. So uh, SGS came back at us two or three times before we eventually agreed to sit around the table and, and discuss mm -hmm. selling the company. But you remained with with the company, so I remained with even the company, though. So yes. uh, and you and you still manage the network of laboratories. Yes. So so that was it, it was not really written into the deal. It was a handshake between me and the CEO of, of uh, SCS, who is Sergio Marcioni, that I would stay on for five years mm -hmm. and continue doing what I had been doing. It Did wasn't really a role for Larry anymore in that kind of executive role because that, that was a function that could be taken over by SGS, but they felt they needed me to stick around to try and keep running this, this sort of network of laboratories that we'd set up. So uh, that was part of the deal. I, I agreed on a handshake to stay mm -hmm. in my role. That I, did, I got a new title of, I think, Vice President uh, Global Metallurgical Operations, something like that. But basically kept on doing the same thing for five years. So did your goals change at all? Not really during that time. Um, it was it was obviously different, you know, running your own show compared to fitting into a very big multinational organization. Uh, certainly in the first couple of years they allowed us to do what we had been doing, but slowly they started fitting this round peg into their square hole and we had to change some of our reporting structures and particularly back office support Whereas we'd done everything ourselves out of Lakefield, we started reporting to different divisions uh, of SGS around the world for financial support and HR support and stuff like that. So that, that uh, from a management point of view, was challenging, that transition. But from a you know, main business perspective, nothing really changed. Uh, it, it, it certainly helped us to be part of this, this global SGS network. And in particular, one of our business lines was uh, mineral analysis, geochem analysis. We had a very big laboratory in, in Lakefield and somewhat smaller geochem analysis laboratories in our, in our other metallurgical labs, but the, the main function was to support our metallurgical business. Although the manager of our analytical group had started getting into custom analytical specifically for their own clients, not, not really related to metallurgical projects. And that side of the business grew very rapidly. So that, that guy, his name is Russ Kaler. He's, uh, he's vice president of SGS in charge of their, their global geochem laboratories. Is now responsible for about 130 laboratories around the world. So, so that mineral analysis part of the business grew very rapidly and it grew under the SGS umbrella. So certainly they helped us on that side big time by being part of that, that much bigger organization. And our, our metallurgical business has also grown. Since, since the acquisition by SGS, we've started up uh, metallurgical laboratories in eastern Russia and Cheetah, um, and to, uh, right here in Vancouver, Toronto, uh, so the, the, the metallurgical world has grown too. Is there an innovation or a set of innovations that you are especially proud of? 
Yeah, you know, I guess you know in that in that part of my uh, my day to day work that wasn't managing the business where I stayed involved on the technology side. I, I've, uh, I, I tend to get drawn into our projects that have technical challenges, so there's probably a disproportionate amount of kind of research type thinking or, or effort that goes into my, my, my technical consulting. And I have been involved in, uh, in, a, in a number of technical innovations, uh, part of the team always, but just, just throwing in ideas and, and uh, directions in which the team should go. It's, it's interesting that um, pro probably the two technologies that I've been involved in developing that have been most successful as far as commercialization is concerned are technologies that were made freely available to the mining industry. We didn't try and own them and we didn't try and sell them. We just uh, sorted them out, published them and said, go for it, you can have it. So that, that the first one was the CIP process. So no, no one earns any royalties or any intellectual property rights as far as that process is concerned. And I believe that that at least was part of the reason why it spread and grew so rapidly. The other one is a much smaller process that I was involved in developing called the SART process. That was, uh, a, uh, it's, it's a process for, for dealing with high levels of cyanide soluble copper in the gold industry. And it's a very neat way of breaking the copper cyanide complex, recovering the copper as a product that you can sell, and recycling the cyanide back into the process. So it has, it has significant economic impact. We did that work for for tech, actually, for Canadian mining company tech. Um, whenever we at Lakeview Research was involved in developing new technology, the client who paid for the work had the right to own it, to patent it, to publish it, to do whatever they wanted. Tech decided that they didn't want to own it, they weren't in the technology business, certainly at that stage. And uh, so we published it, uh, myself and the, the tech uh, representative on that project published it and basically by publishing it made it available to the industry. There's now I think nine or ten site plants that have been built around the world. So I've been involved in the development of other technologies generally owned by the mining companies and the mining companies have patented it and try to keep it to themselves or try to sell it and that hasn't been nearly successful. But mining companies I find don't like to pay for technology. <laughs> what was the most difficult project that you work on or something that you would consider a failure? Well they aren't necessarily both the same thing. I think the most difficult projects we work on today are refractory gold projects. The, there have been a number of sessions at this conference dealing with that. The, the gold ores are getting more complex. Um, they're getting more difficult to to release and liberate the gold. You've got to do more pre-processing before you can recover the gold, and that's all expensive. The gold grades are getting lower and lower. So the, the challenge of economically recovering gold is growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all exciting projects to work on, and uh, they all require little bits of innovation here and there. Otherwise, that deposit stays in the ground, maybe waiting till the gold price is a lot higher. So but they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun for us in the technology development business. They're not much fun for the owners of those deposits. But um, that, that's probably where the greatest challenges are today. That's sort of the, they, they call them refractory gold, where, where gold is locked up in the sulfide matrix and you have to break that matrix in order to release the gold. It's expensive, and uh, if a cheaper way of doing that could be found, that's that's sort of the holy grail in gold processing now, because a significant percentage of the known gold resources in the ground today fall into that category. Mm -hmm. uh, and not, not enough research is being done in that area, unfortunately. Did uh, maybe changing perceptions, changing societal perceptions, or environmental movements have any impact on your work? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's also been part of the reason for our success. We have an environmental consulting group and uh, dealing, dealing with that issue, uh, how, how you're going to deal with the whatever product you produce as waste from, from the operation. It's, it's sort of become the tail that wags the dog. You can't deal with it after you've developed the flow sheet because a big part of the flow sheet development is the tailings you're going to produce. So it can influence the front end of the process. And uh, 
being able to provide the, the testing and the, the facilities to look at that at the same time as you're developing the flow sheet is really important. Um, and we do have that capability. So it's a challenge. Uh, I think um, yeah, the, 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 biggest, the biggest challenge is it, it's, a, it's a moving target. And uh, mining companies are, are finding it, <coughs> I think, you know, certainly Canadian mining companies and, and most of the other Western world mining companies go with the highest current standard. Uh, they, they become very socially and environmentally responsible. Uh, but that standard is moving and um, technology is not moving sometimes fast enough to meet standards that... Uh, I think the other, other problem is there's not always really good rationale that goes into whatever whoever sets that standard. Uh, it's, sometimes it's not set based on really good science. Uh, it's set, set on public perception, emotion, um, and, it, and it can kill a project uh, and kill it for all the wrong reasons. So you, uh, you are a researcher, you are a manager, you run your own company. What would be your advice to young metallurgy students today? Um, what I've said to a lot of young people who joined our organization is uh, learn a little bit about everything, choose something you love, and learn a lot about that. So become, a, become really good at something, specialist at something. But if you want to be valuable and if you want to, to have good job security, learn a little bit about everything in your field. So you, you, can, you can work in different areas and, and you can make intelligent comments in different areas. But if you, want to, if you want to be famous, become very good at something. Pick something you love and learn everything you can about it. And be, I, I, what's really important for me is, is being open to learning from others. Share your knowledge. Uh, don't don't hold it against your chest, and don't be don't be ashamed or scared to make a fool of yourself by making silly statements because you learn through them. So so always be be uh, available to share your knowledge and to learn from others. But, and, and working in the gold area has been fantastic because, as I said, it's a highly collegial, collaborative industry, unlike some. What are you proudest of in your life? My what? What are you proudest of in your life? I think being able to transition from a researcher to a manager of a business and to learn all that side, the res responsibilities of good financial management, of looking after people. At one stage I was responsible for nearly a thousand people. I always had an open door so people could come and cry on my shoulder. Um, that was that was a, a transition that came quite easily to me. It doesn't come to everyone in the technical world. So I, I think being able to to cover those those two bases, I can't say I'm proud of it. I mean that's just me. It's that's what I am. But uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, Anna.